Hello and welcome back. Thank you for staying tuned to this particular session. Uh, let me tell you, this session is going to be really, really interesting because we are going to talk with two innovators or two, you know, tech experts going to tell us how actually they are uh, they are trying to create the reformation and the innovation at their bank. The name of this session is specifically about crafting Telerware products for the customers. As you understand, the theme of this event is hyper personalization creating superior experience for the customer or the better customer experience. And we are trying to learn here in this particular session how these CDOs or the COOs or the CTOs actually trying to create a better customer service and customer experience. So let me introduce my speakers to you first. My first speaker is Ms. Charu Mathur, the CDO and Head Business Strategy Industry Bank. Charu, glad to have you. Yeah, hi. Good to be here. Thank you. And my next speaker is Zuzar Thinawala, the CEO of India and South Asia Standard Chartered Bank. Zuzar, glad to have you. Pleasure to be with you. Guys. Sure, sure. Uh, so let me start with you only, Zuzar. I have a few specific questions and a few common questions. So let me shoot a common question first. As customer demand is increasing, and you know, customer demand for different things is rising now. Uh, every customer wants to, you know, wants him to be served in the way he wants. So my question to you is, how are banks crafting teller products according to the customer needs? Zuzar, I want to take that question first. See, uh, in our mold, the pandemic has both presented us with difficulties at the same time opportunities. I guess, you know, in the changing world, even before pandemic, a lot of organizations were anyway trending towards digitization. And the pandemic has sort of helped that digitization drive like never seen before. It was more a necessity uh, than ever before. And people have sort of diverged towards digitization like never seen before. Now to enable that kind of digitization and expectation from the customers, the banks also have to be nimble, agile, and make quick changes to the Arctic platforms which some of them have been running for years together. Earlier, the technologies were designed by bank keeping the internal processes, guidelines, and efficiency in mind, but that's no more a reality. If the banks have to be any way more relevant now, they have to keep the customer needs in mind. What are the kind of micro dynamics? How are they changing? The Uberization, the Amazons of the world have completely changed the expectation of the banking clients too. And most of the banking clients need instant gratification or instant resolution of either their transactions or their queries. And that, that is you know, a big challenge which is faced by the banks because of the archaic technology and the processes which we had. And I'm glad to say in the past one, one and a half year, we sort of rose to the challenge very efficiently. We have through either voice over network, VPNs, APIs, built bridges with partners and offered those services or product to customers which have become the need of the art. If an earlier instance, I would take a mole, I would take anywhere near a year or two years to develop a technology and deploy it. No more is the case. Anything more than 90 days is more considered to be obsolete. So these are sort of completely transformed, even you know, big giants like most of the foreign banks which operate globally into being nimble and be attentive to the market needs of each market they operate in, which are quite different. Uh, very well said, and thank you for those highlights and offering your first perspective. Zizar. We have some specific questions and we'll come back to you, but let me take a first perspective from Charu as well. Charu, the same question is for you as well. How are you crafting tailor-made products for your banks, depending on the customer needs at your bank? You know, I think the there are some clear shifts that we are seeing in the banking industry happening and specifically the way we are also approaching business now. Um, a lot of digital agenda uh, in the past, I think, was driven with the objective of driving process efficiencies, making more and more um, journeys straight through, uh, giving only channel experience to the customer. But I think that's really table stakes and hygiene. Um, and it's not really going to be enough in any way uh, for the future. And what customers are expecting is actually uh, very simply a convenience and intelligence uh, in the applications that they uh, interact with. So whichever mode we use with the customers, 
I think increasingly I feel that um, customers are really looking for where can you just give me very simple, easy, intelligent dialogue wherever I need you in a very simple form, if I have to put it. Right. And can you just demonstrate to me that you understand me as a consumer? And if I am a 60 year old, will you please not pitch me a two wheeler loan? So just really basic hygiene. Um, so the ask from the clients is, I think, very simple and very uh, understandable. And uh, that's where the shift that I see happening is that uh, banks are now increasingly, and including us, are shifting our focus from being, to an extent, product-centric, process-centric. Uh, and of course, we have to be process-centric, but um, becoming more and more customer-centric. And uh, it is extremely important for us now to understand our clients very deeply and uh, keeping an ear to the ground, keeping our ears uh, close to the clients. And uh, what we are doing, therefore, in that direction now is we are creating end-to-end digital stacks with specific consumer segments in mind. Okay. So one of our first such stack is Indus Merchant Solutions, which has recently been launched in the market. It's keeping in mind the requirements of a retailer uh, at the core of it, at the heart of it. And then everything that that retailer needs to run his business better. Essentially, we want to bring it all together in his hand, in his mobile app. So that's a philosophy that we are taking. uh, And there are some priority business segments that we have identified. And with the same thought process, uh, the idea is to now just be there with the clients and Uh, you know, create end-to-end client value propositions and not just products and process digitization. Okay. Uh, Noted your points, I think, convenience and intelligence and end-to-end value creation, valid points, Charu. Let me shift my gears and start my second round of questions with you only since you spoke about the customer experience and the senior citizen part where a 60-year-old doesn't want to go for an auto loan. So when the customers are demanding this, and these are basic demands, right? Maybe, you know, what you can say, a 60-year-old doesn't want to go for a, you know, bike loan or something like that. How do you actually ensure that your backend will be so nice? How can you use a data and analytics so that, I mean, how tough it is for banks to use data analytics to ensure that your call center is not calling a 60-year-old person to offer a bike loan? (laughs) Yeah. No, sometimes you have to call that person and he may be relevant for a bike loan also. Uh, Yeah. But nevertheless, yes, um, I think you have to really build that intelligence uh, through various layers. And the first layer is the data. And uh, we are therefore investing in organizing the data properly. Um, So there is, um, I think everybody talks about it, three Vs of data. There is velocity of data, there is variety of data, and there's the sheer volume of data. Uh, But you have to intelligently have your data engineering in place. And you need to know what is the data that really adds value uh, for building that intelligence. And what is the data that, you know, really does not add that much immediate value. So, uh, because it's very easy to get lost in humongous loads of data, which is available today, structured, unstructured in various shapes and forms. So we are investing capabilities in building that basic data foundation. And that's a very critical function as you go along. And then sitting on top of that, uh, what you need is an intelligent modeling capability or a data science function, as we call it, leveraging machine learning, leveraging artificial intelligence, uh, having the ability to connect dots and make logical sense out of it. And then at the top, the third thing that you need is a delivery mechanism. So how do you ensure that uh, at every touch point where the client is, you are making sense to him? If he's out somewhere, then are you relevant, uh, you know, in that moment for the customer? If I can detect that you are right now on a post terminal shopping for something, can I show you my best offer and nudge you to take out my plastic, for example? So those are the type of applications that we have to think through and then uh, reverse work and get the data and analytics and the engagement piece in order from those business objectives. So I I think in my view, it's good to start with the business objective and then, you know, work backwards and have everything towards delivering that. It just helps create a better measurable impact. Uh, But yeah, data engineering, data science and the engagement stack are the three basic things that have to fall in place right uh, noted your points and uh, 
let me bring back Zuzar here. And Zuzar, I would like you also to tell us what kinds of changes banks have to go through at the backend processes to do all this, crafting dedicated products to the customers and serve him the way he wants. The changes with the bank has to do is very simple. And that is towards leverage the data. Banks have traditionally been holding a lot of data, enriched data about customer behavior, customer patterns, patterns of transactions, which can which have so far been you know, present in the bank system. But nowhere has in the past efforts been concentrated, efforts been made to sort of leverage this whole humongous data and find out patterns for consumer behaviors emerging from these humongous sort of data. So the next trend, then, which has already started, in a very big way, as uh, Charu rightly mentioned, is the data analytics or data science, which the banks are now deploying. And initially, it started with a very internal focus of identifying frauds or AML patterns, because the system can pick up similar type of patterns, buyer, seller, similar amounts in patterns with the country, et cetera, and highlight areas of potential frauds or AML risks. This is how it all started, but now it's more maturing into predicting customer behavior, how a customer would behave when he enters into a mall, what is his level of interest, which product he actually buys, which brand does he prefer. And in, in you know, keeping all that data in mind, can I give him a real-time offer? It could be you know physical offer, it could be online, whether the person is on Amazon or anywhere else. If we can if we have observed the pattern and you know, we can leverage that pattern, there's a huge upside in terms of how the bank designs this product and how it offers it to its customers to make it more relevant and in return get more revenue out of those products. So, so I copy the points that you mentioned, but could you just tell us how accurate is your data? Because all the decision making today when you want to offer this, you know, a refined customer service and refined customer products. To the customers, everything is dependent on the data. So, how accurate is the data in decision making? Among the data is very accurate, and it, it the accuracy of the data will show you up patterns and suggestions. But however, decision making is something the humans will have to take based on those patterns or those suggestions emerging from the data which is collated over a period of time. And this, believe me, has been a boom because. If any decision I had to take before, I had to, many a times it was a decision by cuts or, you know, weeks of hard work by two or three people churning out data and preparing a PPT or an Excel spreadsheet and telling, coming to the conclusions. But machine, by the virtue of machine learning, AI are now able to click this, you know, generate this kind of information at a click of a data. But what it does is it brings you or it gives you the data points. It doesn't take a decision on your behalf. At the end of it, what is right for the organization, what is going to be appropriate, there has to be still a human decision. That's why they say that however much the AI will progress, it will never replace the human intelligence. Okay, noted your points and I will, I will take this conversation forward with Charu. I have a very important question for you. Uh, when I look at the applications of the banks, you know, mobile apps, which I'm talking about, it is offering like plethora of services. You can buy insurance, open FT, do so many things. So these are the best services. But when it comes to communication, still the chatbots, the RPAs, these are the, you know, I, I won't say these are traditional, but these are the common ways that the banks are still using. So what is the way of better communication? Because maybe you will have to deal with a 60-year-old differently than a 20-year-old differently. So what kind of you know, infrastructure are you building to cater to the customers in a different manner? I think uh, we have seen a very remarkable uh, shift per se. And um, people are taking to uh, various channels, uh, you know, with ease. So, of course, there is a lot of, um, a lot of transactions that a client can do through the mobile app. Uh, but I, I do think that chat is very powerful. And uh, especially if you look at something like a WhatsApp, um, it cuts across segments, uh, whether you're running a business, uh, whether you are NRI or whether you are an HNI. I have seen uh, something like that speak across segments uh, very much with ease. And then, so it's, it depends on the client segment that you're catering to. So we are, a, so for example, we are a very diverse set of clients within the bank. So we have a whole um, 
Bharat Financial, which is at the bottom of the pyramid, which is part of the bank. Uh, we also cater to non-residents, HNIs. We are, of course, uh, heavily focused on business owners and SMEs as a, as a bank. So we have seen that different things uh, work for different clients. Uh, so language is an aspect and the mode of communication and channel of engagement is also an aspect. So when we speak to a lot of clients which are at the bottom of pyramid or even in the business owner segment, at times the vernacular language plays a much, um, you know, definitely gives you a much better lift in engagement compared to what you may do in English. Uh, and of course, there are channels like WhatsApp uh, which permeate all segments with ease. And then there are channels which, of course, have uh, better reception in some specific uh, customer segments. So, and that is exactly what increasingly is feeding back uh, into the data models. When we define uh, a data model and we say that this is a type of a customer where we believe this type of a product or this type of an engagement will be relevant. Uh, the other thing to ask is also, what will be the best way to engage on this item with the customer? And that's increasingly becoming very important uh, when we define our engagement strategy. Okay. So, uh, noted your points, Daru. Uh, Zuzar, I'm sure you also come from not only a typical, uh, you're not only observing the Indian customers, but you also carry a background of a global bank. Right? The problem is also this, that till, you know, maybe a, till last 10 years, you know, the banking was absolutely different. And the kind of services that the banks and the financial institutions started offering in the last few years are absolutely remarkable and far more innovative, which also giving a fillip to the customers to come with a different demands. You know, and I was talking to a banker from ANZ. He says, my biggest challenge is that my customer wants me to serve them on a Twitter and a LinkedIn, right? So one, how do we justify all these demands of the customers? And, you know, uh, is it really difficult to service or serve all the demands of the customers? One thing for banking is different from a Twitter or a WhatsApp is that we're dealing in financial transactions and, you know, the community or the clients also they need to understand there's a lot of responsibility on the bank in terms of the safety and the security of their money, which is lying with the bank. So another, another, you know, I wouldn't say a problem, but another challenge that comes with more and more digitization is the risk of cyber security. So, you know, we can, we can do a lot of things on a lot of channels, but how secure it is. Because easily for you and me to chat on our platform is very simple. You know, we don't have to have the same level of security as you would need to have on a channel where you're doing your payments. And obviously, two are different things. So, yes, we need to get a good blend of the two. The customers today expect channels which are completely frictionless. At the same time, it cannot be as simple as a click of a button on a WhatsApp because there needs to be a lot of validation. There needs to be a lot of check-in that need to be performed because we're dealing with financial transactions and not a mere chat. So good healthy balance of these two is, I would feel, uh, what a customer would be looking at. So if you look at any online banking platform of the banks, now uh, banks are offering more and more predictive analysis to the customers in terms of the spend that the individual customers make, what is his budget for the month? How does, his, how does his overall spend sheet look like? These are the additional facilities the banks have started providing to the customers. And you know, we've also started offering chat boxes, which are similar, somewhat similar to you know, WhatsApp and others, but it's in an enclosed environment where the risk uh, the data is protected and the safety and the security of the data is maintained. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I do tend to agree that the expectation as well as the security aspects, mm -hmm. both need to be balanced when we are offering such products mm -hmm. to the client. So, so let me also quickly ask you, you know, since the, because ultimately the responsibility is high, you know, are high on your shoulder of protecting their data and, you know, offering the secured services and more importantly, protecting their money. So, so you know, do you say that at some times banks will also maybe put a, what you can say, a line over there that will not cross, they will offer so many services, but perhaps will not cross sell all the products. Maybe, you know, we'll, we'll stick to XYZ uh, benchmark. Do you think so? So, Amul, I would say every bank has got its own strategy and own areas of focus. So a bank would roll out products and focus on the strategy, which, you know, each one has uh, sort of best suited to meet its requirement. 
For foreign banks, it may not be having a similar kind of expansion plan like a city or an H, uh, sorry, like an ICICI bank or an HDFC bank in India. We would like to have different priorities that focus on few other trade and cross cross country segments. So each each bank's focus on the product that is offers is different. But at the same time, as you brought a relevant point out that digitization does mean a lot of ease of transacting with the organization with zero human intervention. At the same time, it also needs to ensure the safety and security of your assets with the organization. And a good healthy balance of two is equally important before right. any organization offers this product digitally to its customers. Right. Point uh, uh, Charu, I will come back to you and I would like you to tell us your priorities because when there are demands are high, uh, you know, what are the priorities that you put into the list okay, when offering customer service, when offering tailor-made uh, services because ultimately the customer, like I said, wants everything. And to offer those services, my second part of the question, Charu, is, you know, I'm sure you cannot do everything on your own because your core is banking, lending, uh, crafting products. You want aggregators like fintechs and everything to support you. So how do you actually take their support to, you know, maybe offer the services to the customers? I think we have a universal approach uh, to banking. So I think if a client wants um, services on a platform, um, the the thought process is that we should be available as much as the client wants us to be available for him. So that's uh, very much there. But at the same time, what we are now working on is that we don't want to overwhelm a client. So it's not that um, the same set of products are relevant for everybody. So while you have a whole lot of products as a bank, how do you ensure that it's not becoming an information overload, a product uh, overload for a customer. And as and when the customer matures through his life cycle, he can unlock the additional benefits that he wants to. Mm -hmm. If he's traveling abroad, he can look at a Forex proposition. But it's we, so the idea now is how do you keep it simple at the core uh, for the client? And he will unlock as and when he wants to, uh, whatever he wants in terms of products. And uh, yeah, the journeys have to be designed the experience has to be designed with that objective okay. so that is something that we are cautiously working on across all of our client facing platforms mm -hmm. um the second part of your question uh, was how do we look at collaborations uh, i think we are very uh, very excited about the space uh, of collaborations uh, there is a lot of fintech players now um, while it's a mixed bag but there is quite a few which have created extremely exciting customer value propositions who have deeply tried to understand some consumer pain points and have genuinely tried to solve them very intelligently. And um, for us, so we bring our strengths to the table and we are uh, looking at uh, various uh, partners in the ecosystem who can bring complementing strengths to us. So some of these complementing strengths are in the products that we may not want to do on our own. So let's say consumer finance or a very small ticket checkout financing as a product. Now, we may not want to offer it directly uh, on our own. It requires a slightly different DNA and the skill set. And the other area where we are keenly looking at partners is if you can help me enrich the experience for my client. So if I have a small retailer and I am delivering a certain value proposition to that client, could you bring something additional to me? It could be inventory management solutions, logistics. So there is a bunch of players who have done uh, pretty good work and we are very proactively looking at, uh, you know, collaborating with some of these fintechs to enrich the value propositions as well as to complement our stack of products. Okay, okay. So, so going ahead, do you also define a line that, you know, perhaps whatever the services that you want to offer to customers, you know, these 10 services, which are hardcore services will be offered by the bank, but for another 10 services, we'll go ahead with the fintechs. Is that the strategy? Um, it's not like a hard line. I wouldn't say it's like a very rigid line, hmm. uh, but it's a constantly evolving thing. But yes, uh, within the realm of banking and financial services, we may extend and go deeper and make our proposition a little more enriched directly as well. And then, of course, uh, there is a bunch of value-added services which are not technically banking, but we believe they help enrich 
consumer engagement with us because right. like when a customer is thinking of a car loan he is not just thinking of a car loan right he is thinking of purchasing a car yes so how do i solve everything that is going on in his mind when he is making a purchase decision of a car right. so if i restrict myself to thinking about loan then you know could i just offer him everything that he is thinking about be it his accessories or insurance or other aspects so some of the non financial aspects we will uh, you know continue to have a collaboration into the ecosystem sort of a model for those the value added services which are not in the nature of financial services okay okay uh this is our i will come back to you and my quick or a straight forward question is how do you measure the customer experience how do you measure okay act that you develop or the that you offer is enjoyed by the by the customer is it a forward question because now banks like you know They they are helping customer not only in a car loan but helping him choose a car, helping him choose a home for a home loan. How do you actually measure all this? So every bank Kamol uh, has got an NPS score, Net Promoter Score, which uh, talks about how the customers you know review your product and services, and we get enriched information from our from our customers during these surveys. And just to let you know, this is the first time we were just discussing yesterday sometime. even the regulator like an rbi has come out with its own review of products and services offered by various banks to individual and they've come out with their own scores and you know how they view as with different banks offering services so over and above each individual bank doing its own survey of net promoter scores even the regulator has now started taking some interest in the level of services offered by each bank so there are various tools and measures where we will do it and it gives every organization very enriched information in terms of where we are doing more and where we need to do more okay charu do you also want to add here because you know i i know you don't come from a, a psu bank but generally there is a saying that if you go to a psu bank maybe you will have to cross at least four windows because every officer will shift, ask you to go to a next window right so that's also one of the experience that people you know get at the branches but how do you actually measure the happiness or the customer experience at uh the mobile applications and all the digital services that you are you know implementing yeah no uh you know i think it's very uh so there are formal mechanisms and there are metrics like uh, you know i spoke about uh, net promoter score which is a great metric to look at the client satisfaction but i think i'll tell you the feedback is so constant and so open these days so if you look at your mobile app it's out there in the public and the public is speaking about it and it is on the app store so it is the um, there is just so much constant feedback mm. that we get on how we are doing uh, is just for us to really pay serious attention to it and then keep on improving basis what clients are telling us so there is a bunch of things that we measure we look at how clients are rating us on various platforms there is prom- net promoter score surveys that are done and now since you mentioned this we are very very seriously looking at something called as first contact resolution can i just make sure that first contact is a resolved thing for the client and how do i enable my entire frontline be it in a contact center or in a branch uh, digitally so much that uh, they really don't have to make him go to another window and because it's with technology it's very easy to make some of the complicated things can be made very easy that anybody can do them I'm done with my basic questions. Let me come with the last question, which is again a follow-up on the first question that I asked. And uh, uh, how do you actually see the banking in terms of services, in terms of products? Maybe next three to five years, because the kind of evolution happening in this space is remarkable, and we actually don't know what will happen. So tomorrow, you know, we are actually shifting from branch to apps. You know, the regulators are also looking at it. So those are I will ask you this question, and then we shift to Charu. how do you see the whole customer experience and tailor made products shifting in next 2 to 5 years come on the way and it's already headed in the next 5 to 6 years is a long term i would see from the next 2 or 3 years yeah. what what all the organizations are doing including our own bank is we're doing a lot of analytics on the queries and the customer interactions we have hmm. the queries are the way customers call you up complains or they have issues with the way we offer our products or services this becomes a rich source of information in terms of how to modify mm. and alter our products to reduce the friction which we have with the client the whole idea is to have end to end client experience with minimal human interaction 
And that journey is only going to be possible to a very large extent if you pay a lot of attention to the data that comes in. For an example, I'll give you, if we were receiving about 100 queries, I'm just giving you a very big example in a month. Sure. By, by analyzing those 100 queries, today we have been able to automate almost 65% of those queries and we've provided that information proactively to the customers so they don't need to call you. This, what does this entail? It removes the friction between banking. You actually anticipate if you do trending of your queries of what the clients do need over and above the information which you're already providing. And by proactively providing that, mm -hmm. you, you are actually reducing his effort to call you up and seek those information from the bank. That's one. And what I personally feel is that the interaction between the client and the bank on mundane, on mundane task will be almost minimal or zero. The interaction would be on much richer, you know, discussions like investments, like there are structured transactions which need to be done and where guidance or consultancy from the bankers are required. So more in terms of the rich value added services is what the banks would trend towards moving away from the traditional, you know, debit credit voucher mechanism or clearing of check mechanism over a period of time. Okay, not okay. your points. Charu, what do you think? What kind of services, development products do you see emerging in the banking space in the next two to five years? Yeah, I mean, now uh, I think it's um, going through a very, very exciting phase. And uh, there are two, three things which I think will play out. Uh, one of the things which is very powerful and I think which will play out in banking soon um, is this entire um, innovations driven out of composability. And I think, you know, while we have been for a while speaking about um, being very, very making increasing the resilience of your systems being on cloud native and agile and all of that i think one of the things which i believe will play a big role in furthering innovation will be how the composable systems which are coming into play uh, which are completely api native to the core and more and more banks are adopting them uh, globally as well as in india uh, which will basically allow you to create products and services completely tailor-made to a client's unique requirements. So, you know, a personal loan does not necessarily have to be a term product with a 6, 12, or 18-month tenure. It can be delivered in many, many different ways, the way the customer wants to consume it. So, um, and that is possible with the new age systems, which are composable to the core, uh, which is essentially... Um, like taking modularity to a next level. So that is an important shift uh, which will spur innovation. And the second thing is, of course, cloud. Um, I do see the power of cloud uh, unleashing uh, in terms of the client experience that we can provide. I think uh, the cloud strategy is going to play a very important role for us over the next two, three years. And uh, the third thing which I feel... Um, will play a major role uh, in driving customer experience is the personalization aspect. So we see brands like Amazon and Netflix do it very well. Uh, but I think more and more banks uh, will probably uh, start delivering something uh, on the personalization aspect uh, and demonstrate their ability of understanding a customer much deeper uh, than what we do today. Okay. Uh noted your points uh, before i wrap up let me take one quick question on the fintech side fintechs are also emerging and offering their own services at one side you know fintechs like payment companies or fintech companies like amazon or google pay are also offering ft services fixed deposit and many other services so what kind of changes do you see there going ahead from the fintech side in terms of building ui ux and offering better customer service no, uh, I think at the end of the day, you know, um, there is a, there is a good collaboration uh, which can emerge out of the entire model. Uh, but it's also very clear that at the end of the day, um, at the back, it's a bank, at least in the Indian market, which is supporting a fintech. And therefore, it's a lot of responsibility on the banks, uh, which are partnering in the ecosystem to ensure that the, the data privacy, the data security aspects, uh, the cyber security aspects, whoever be the front end, which is interacting with the client could be any application, but it has to be at the same level 
uh, in terms of compliances and security aspects as we are when we extend our platforms and applications uh, to the customers. But having said that, I think uh, fintechs do offer us a reach of uh, unparalleled level. I mean, they have a lot of clients and uh, it is possible to extend your services to a lot of clients through fintechs. But it has to be done in a very responsible manner, uh, keeping security and compliance aspects. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, two, three years back, you know, we thought that FinTech is going to compete with the banks. Uh, but our experience has been, yes, there has been some competition, but there has been some, uh, you know, complement. they can also complement the existing platforms that are provided by the banks. So, if the banks can effectively integrate uh, with the fintechs, uh, you know, through APIs and through other tools available, we don't need to make changes to our core banking platforms. We can offer, we can modify, we can stay attuned, uh, you know, to the customer requirements. Very little investments by leveraging the existing strength of the fintechs. Second point, which Aru mentioned, is you know, within the fintechs, will there need to have some bank? do a collection account and sweeping account and maintain. So it's an opportunity actually for the banks that get the accounts out there over a period of time. And both people like you and me may deal with 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 rupees on these platforms. But when it comes to lakhs or crores, we will not be rooting it through those. So to some extent, uh, you know, the integrity and the trust in the banking market still exist and will continue to exist because they are regulated entities and these entities currently are not but may very soon come under the Review of the regulators and the same kind of controls they come through, which will sort of impact their ability to offer these products in the city which they're currently doing. So it would be a level playing field over a period of time when the regulations start governing them too. But our experience has been fintechs have been more of an opportunity than a threat to the bank. If you identify the right areas to partner with them, we've also partnered globally with a lot of fintechs on blockchain and other areas. A second important point is, you know, a lot of banks also are going completely digital. We've come out with a complete digital bank over and above our bank in Hong Kong. Mm. So, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot to learn from these fintechs. And it is keeping the banks on their toes and keeping on, innov uh, you know, innovating and doing the right thing. And that will help us to learn a lot and stay in the market and compete with them. Right. Uh, uh, noted your point, uh, Zuzar, and I think... Uh, it was a really remarkable one, but Chandu mentions a really valid point on the experience. So, thank you once again, you know, gentlemen. I mean, like and gentlemen, I must say, for sharing a remarkable perspective here on customer experience and the product which clients are actually thinking of and working in that direction. Thank you so much for your views and your time on watch.